Well, good morning. My name is Pastor Ashley, and I'm the worship slash intern slash social media slash other stuff pastor. And man, it is such a privilege to be able to share with you guys what God's put on my heart today. But before we get started, I know Pastor Lance just kind of talked about this a little, but can we just give a huge round of applause to our young people this morning? They've done such an amazing job. They've been preparing for six weeks in our purpose program that we do every fall and spring, and they've just been doing an awesome job. And today, they've been able to put to practice all the things that they've been learning. Um, you know, one of my favorite things about our church is that the heart behind our leadership is the desire to invest and raise up leaders. So for those of you who don't know, I actually came to Neighborhood Church in 2011, and I was a freshman in high school. Um, and so this is literally where I grew up with you guys here at Neighborhood. And I'll never forget the first time Pastor Lance invited me to lead worship in big church. And I was in high school, and I was scared to death. I was scared of that. But through that opportunity and so many countless others, Neighborhood Church and the people here are the ones who raised me up and taught me how to lead. And so to now be here with you today, speaking on Youth Takeover Sunday alongside some really cool junior hires and high schoolers who are right where I was almost 10 years ago, it's such a full circle moment for me. And I just want you to know it means so much to me. So thank you. But enough of the sappy stuff. But for reals, <laughs> for reals, if, for those of you who have been at Neighborhood for years and years and those who are newer to the family, if today encourages you at all, please let it be this, that you are a part of a church that truly cares for and invests in building the kingdom of God and raising up leaders to keep fulfilling that. Yeah. So this morning, I want to speak into one of our all-time favorite topics ever. You know those days when you wake up late, you jump out of bed, you skip the shower, you throw on the cleanest clothes you can find nearby, you grab your stuff, you jump in the car, and of course you forget at least two things that you need for that day. You brush your hair while you drive at least 20 miles per hour over the speed limit, and then it happens. You hit the red light. For those of you who just took that journey with me, I don't even have to describe what it feels like when you hit that red light but I will. What? Come on, let's go. I don't have time for this. And then the light turns green. But one problem, the person in front of you didn't slam on the accelerator right away. So there you are, half of your hair brushed, your shirt on inside out, you're late to work or you're late to school, no breakfast, no Starbucks in hand, and the person in front of you didn't go right when it turned green. Cue the aggressive honk, right? Why? Because this person in front of you made you wait two extra seconds of your day, and it is unacceptable. Unacceptable. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about one of our favorite things ever, which is waiting. And not the waiting I just described, but the waiting that God calls us to. The waiting that requires us to let go of control and trust his timing and his plans. So I want to ask you this morning, what are you waiting on the Lord for? Maybe you're waiting for God to answer your prayers and hear you because it feels like he's been silent. Maybe you're waiting for God to heal you from a sickness or a disease. Maybe you're waiting for God to mend and restore a broken relationship or a broken marriage. Maybe you're waiting for God to bring your son or daughter back to the Lord or a friend who hasn't given their life to Jesus to finally make that decision. What are you waiting for God to do? We're all waiting for something. And before we go into what God says about it, I want to encourage you to answer this personally because today will be so much more meaningful if it's personal. Maybe it's something you've been praying for and seeking for for as long as you can remember and you don't really consider it waiting anymore because you've just accepted it's the way that your life is going to be. Somewhere down the line, you lost hope and stopped waiting on God. Watch this.
I'm a good Christian. I go to church, read the Bible, and say a prayer before every meal. I give my offerings every week, and I never miss a service. I'm a good kid. I stay out of trouble. I walk through the lobby on Sundays and see familiar faces. I mean, this is where I grew up. This is my home. They say to me, you look so much like your dad. I can even sing the songs I learned in kids' church. Like, Jesus, you're my superhero. <laughs> and I got a very good big God, and he's always by my side. But is he? Is he always by my side? I just don't feel it. I'm a good Christian, so why don't I feel God? I see people come up to altars week after week. I see God showing up in other people's lives. I do everything I'm supposed to do. So why doesn't it happen for me too? Is there something wrong with me? Does God just not want to draw close to me? I keep waiting and waiting and waiting. I keep waiting to feel God like I've never felt him before. I keep waiting for God to give me a testimony. I keep waiting for God to hear my prayers. But (laughs) I keep waiting and waiting. Where are you, God? Why have you left me? I know you're always by my side. I just don't feel it. I don't see it. (sighs) Where are you? I'm waiting. Eleven years. It's been eleven years since the doctors told me my diagnosis. It's cancer. What will happen if I don't make it? What will happen to my kids? Will I ever get to see them graduate, get married, have kids? Fear, worry, and anxiety crept in. That was the first time I felt completely alone. God, if you can hear me, please heal me. Year three came along, and I sat in the doctor's office. You're in remission. We celebrated. God heard my prayers. He truly answered my cries. Year five came along, and I sat in the doctor's office again. I'm so sorry, but it's back. I felt alone again. This pattern repeated itself again and again. I am tired of waiting for God to completely take away my sickness. I am tired of waiting for breakthrough and healing. 11 years, 11 years and still no word from God, no healing, just bad news again. Your word says you heal the sick and the broken, so why not me, God? Why not me? I am tired of being in the place of waiting for a miracle, waiting for a light at the end of this long, horrifying, dark tunnel. I've been here for 11 years years. I'm waiting. Where are you? I sit here in the church service. I look to my left. I look to my right. And still they are not back. I have been praying and praying to see them come back to the Lord. In fact, I don't think I've ever prayed this hard before in my life, but still they walk away. God, do you hear my prayers? Do you hear my voice at all? Your word says you sent your only son to save the world because you loved us, but why haven't you saved my friend? I remember when they came to service with me, prayed with me, encouraged me, and now I see them run from you, reject you, and resent you. I cry out to you every night to save them, bring them back to you. But I can't help but think, is there a point to me praying for them to find you again? Do my prayers even count? I don't want to see them struggle, God. I want to see them experience the God I know. Is that too much to ask? You planted a seed, they tell me. They say, just be patient. God will save them. 
But the thought creeps in, will you save them, God? I'm waiting. Where are you? How many of us have asked that question before? God, where are you? When it feels like God has left us, we question him. We doubt the goodness of God. We think, if he is truly for me, he wouldn't allow me to go through this. We complain and grow weary because sometimes we just get tired of the waiting. The question we have to answer today isn't whether or not we will have to wait or whether we should or shouldn't wait because waiting is inevitable. It's not something we can avoid in this life. Rather, the question we need to answer today is this. How do we wait? How do you wait? Let's take a moment and ask God to open our hearts. Would you pray with me? Lord, we just invite you here right now, God. I pray right now that you would give me the words to say. God, help me just to share what you've put on my heart in a way that just makes sense. And God, give us hearts to receive your word this morning, Lord, in your name. Amen. So let's take a look at the book of Lamentations. It's Jeremiah talking, and this is right after the people of Jerusalem lost their city to the Babylonians. Jerusalem was destroyed. There was so much devastation. And Jeremiah, he was called to be a prophet. And this was against the family norm because his dad was actually a Jewish priest. So God called him, Jeremiah, to be a preaching prophet in Judah. And it began under the rule of King Josiah. Jeremiah was doing life with these people. So to see them destroyed, to see their city destroyed, and to see them turn to sin instead of towards repentance and towards God, it affected Jeremiah. Let's turn to Lamentations chapter 3. It's Jeremiah talking. Chapter 3, verse 4. It says, He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. You see, Jeremiah knew bitterness to unwanted outcomes. In verse 7, he says, He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He's talking about God. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. You guys, Jeremiah knew the heaviness of his burdens, and he knew the feeling of God shutting out his prayers and not hearing him. In verse 16, he says, He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes, my soul bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished, so has my hope from the Lord. You see, Jeremiah knew the pain of a hopeless situation. In verse 19, he says, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers and is bowed down within me. You see, Jeremiah knew what it was like to always be thinking about his struggles and to constantly be overwhelmed by it all. Jeremiah knew disappointment, he knew hurt, he knew sadness, he knew what it was like to pray and see his prayers not answered in the way he wanted. So here we are, Jeremiah is obviously hurt and he's struggling. He's super descriptive about his pain and disappointments. He says, his teeth grind on gravel. He's made my chains heavy. He's broken my bones. He's filled with bitterness and tribulation. I mean, Jeremiah is really giving us a visual of the state of his heart. He's in turmoil. He's defeated. He's broken down. He even says he's forgotten what happiness is. I know some of you are thinking, wow, we need to have Pastor Ashley preach more often. But can we get real for a moment? Some of these things Jeremiah is voicing are things we feel. These aren't Old Testament feelings irrelevant to today. Sometimes we pray with all that we have, and God doesn't answer right away or the way we want him to. Sometimes we go through seasons of struggle, and we become bitter towards God for allowing us to walk through it. 
And it leaves us wondering, like, God, what are you doing? What's going on up there? So we, te- we get to the end of these things Jeremiah is describing, teeth grinding, heavy chains, broken bones, which is basically rock bottom. And then what? Chapter 3, verse 21, it says, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What? (laughs) Weren't you just sitting there when we read the verses before? Where Jeremiah was literally done at his end. And then verse 25, it says, and we're going to land here for a moment. It says, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. How can Jeremiah go from complete turmoil to unexplainable peace in his waiting? Because it's how we wait that counts. It's how we wait that counts. And guys, the beautiful thing about this is that how we wait is our choice. So if we want what Jeremiah explained, what's the choice? Number one, we have to choose to trust. Choose to trust. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. The Good News Bible puts it this way. The Lord is good to everyone who trusts in him. So we have to understand this. Waiting is a control issue. That's essentially what trust is all about. You see, the people of Jerusalem chose sin and old habits over God's way. They thought their way was the best way, that their way was better than waiting. Yet as we read Jeremiah's point of view in Lamentations, we see that their their way led to destruction, captivity, and defeat. And God didn't set them up for those things. They set themselves up for defeat, defeat by how they chose to wait. And they chose to not trust God's plan and rather to work things out the way they seemed right. Waiting is a control issue. Choose to trust God. In Genesis 15 and 16, we see um, God ask Abraham at the time, Abram, to wait. Abraham's getting older. He's realizing he has no sons to inherit all of his stuff. And he remembers God made a promise to him that he would have a son, and it hadn't, yet, it hadn't been fulfilled yet. So Genesis 15, 4, it says, The Lord spoke his word to Abram. He will not be the one to inherit what you have. You will have a son of your own who will inherit what you have. Then verse 5, it says, Then God led Abram outside and said, Look at the sky. There are so many stars, you cannot count them. Your descendants also will be too many to count. So here we see his struggle. He wants to have a son with his wife, Sarah. They're getting older. He's wondering why it hasn't happened yet. He's feeling frustrated in the waiting. So what does God do? God reminds him of the promise that he's made to him, saying he will give him the son. So in the next chapter, chapter 16, Abraham's wife Sarah started getting a little bit impatient. She tells Abraham in Genesis 16 too, look, the Lord has not allowed me to have children. So have sexual relations with my slave girl. If she has a child, maybe I could have my family through her. So basically Sarah's like, Abraham, I'm done waiting. I don't trust God's doing anything. He isn't fixing this for us. So I'm going to take this into my own hands and problem solve myself. And as we read this, like Sarah's answer, her, her problem solving to this, an- to this situation they're in, sounds pretty absurd, right? It sounds pretty crazy. But when we are unwilling to wait, we will find ourselves resorting to desperate measures to fulfill a promise that only God can fulfill. So after the servant Hagar gave birth to her son Ishmael, chaos broke out. Things got hard. There was pain. There was drama. Why? Because the choice to not trust God always comes with a price. Why? Because God's way always has our best in mind. Now, did God ever come through on his promise? Yes, 14 years later. Only now, they had additional pain and struggle that was not God's design. 
So here's the bottom line. Hear this. Sarah and Abraham took control over the situation. They chose not to trust God. They said no thanks to the unknown yet promised plan of God. For what? For control? For a guaranteed solution? You guys, when we put our abilities and our strengths and our game plans next to God's ability and strength and master plan, we pale in comparison. Stepping out of control means stepping into peace, yet we view it the exact opposite way. We say, like, if I step out of control, I will lose everything. We believe this lie that we have to know what's coming next in order to be okay. We believe the lie that stepping out of control means stepping into chaos. But when we open God's word and we see the nature of God and the kind of God that he is, we understand this, that stepping out of control means submitting to him and choosing trust because he always has our best in mind. First Samuel, we hear about a woman named Hannah. She was married to a man along with another woman, and Hannah really wanted to have kids in a family of her own, but she couldn't have kids. In a culture where being a mother was prized and valued above everything else, we can imagine the shame and the disappointment Hannah felt. The other wife would actually tease her and make her feel less than and not valued. Hannah's family would go to worship God. They would go to worship and make sacrifices every single year. And over the years, Hannah was just waiting and waiting for a family of her own. But still, every year, when the time came to go and worship, she chose to worship. Hannah chose to rejoice and worship in the middle of her waiting. In a situation where she could have followed Sarah's example and taken matters into her own hands and taken over control and not trusted God, she instead chose to worship the Lord while she waited. We get to choose how we wait. Choose to trust. The second thing we need to choose is choose hope. Let's look back at Lamentations 3.25. In the New Century Version, it says, The Lord is good to those who hope in him. If waiting means placing hope in God, then waiting requires an expectant heart. It requires an expectant heart. Because number one, it requires us to believe that God is who he says he is. Number two, it requires us to believe and keep praying for that thing we are waiting on and to choose hope. And number three, it requires us to eagerly expect that God will do what he says. But sometimes it's really difficult to find that expectant heart. In the midst of extreme disappointment, in dead ends, and years of unanswered prayer and letdown, it can be hard to keep expecting and believing. When we let disappointment overtake our expectant heart, it can look like a lot of different things. It can look like complaining about your situation, saying things like, well, this sucks. I guess this is my new normal. Why doesn't God ever do what I ask? It can look like fear over trust, right? Instead of actually expecting God to heal, restore, and redeem, I'd rather not put myself through that heartache and pain again. Because if it doesn't happen again, I don't think I can handle that. I'm too scared of what might happen. So I'm just going to detach and stop expecting God to do it. It can look like anger or frustration. Seriously, God, what's going on up there? I'm done waiting with expectancy because nothing ever comes of that. It can look like grief. I don't think I can take any more letdowns. It's too hard to hope for the best because the benefit never comes. I need to not expect it so they don't feel that grief when it comes. This is what it sounds like when we lose hope. We become jaded, shaded, and worn. Listen, you might be in a seemingly hopeless situation. You know, the disciples, after just witnessing Jesus crucified on the cross, were in a seemingly hopeless situation. The synagogue leader, Jairus, whose daughter was at the point of death, 
He was in a seemingly hopeless situation. Paul, chained up in prison, facing a death sentence, was in a seemingly hopeless situation. Even my mom, when the doctors told her she had maybe months to live after her stage four cancer diagnosis, she was in a seemingly hopeless situation. I have no doubt in my mind that some of the circumstances you have faced or are facing right now have been seemingly hopeless situations. I understand that waiting for something that seems impossible makes losing hope look like the easiest, best option, or even the only option. Because hear this, when we, when we fixate on the impossible, we tend to lose hope. But when we focus on a God who conquers that impossible, how can we not have hope? When we fixate on the impossible, when we say things like, I'll never be free from this stronghold, my kids will never serve the Lord, I'll never have, a, have children and a family of my own, when we fixate on these impossible things, we're probably going to lose hope. Because what are we holding up to our face, right? We're allowing this to be our only perspective, and we're not getting the full picture of what God is doing, But when we focus on a God who conquers that impossible, the God who raised from the dead, the God who did and still does miracles, the God who casts out demons, the God who makes the lame walk and heals the sick, the God who loves you and is for you, when you focus on him, how can you not have hope? Choosing to focus on God is how we grow an expectant heart. We have to choose it. Choose hope. Hannah, like we just talked about, she was in a seemingly hopeless situation. In fact, she was tormented and made fun of while she waited. But she chose to believe and expect that God would hear her prayers, her years and years of prayers. Waiting means not losing hope. Hannah chose hope because she adjusted her focus. She didn't focus on the hopeless situation or the hurtful words being thrown at her, or the time that she spent waiting. She focused on what? On God, and she believed in what he could do. So the result of choosing hope and having an expectant heart means we are actively waiting. We aren't being complacent. What do I mean? Waiting on God requires action. Waiting on God means serving. So do you guys remember when we used to be able to go out to eat? Like at restaurants, indoors. This is a very unfamiliar experience for 2020. So for the illustration's sake, let's say you go out to eat in 2019. The waiter comes to your table. She welcomes you in. She takes your order. And then what? Does she go sit down? No. She's refilling drinks. She's bringing extra napkins. She's placing your order for you. She's waiting on you. She isn't sitting in the back room watching TV till the next order comes in. She's expecting what's next. She's checking in every few minutes, helping prepare and clean. She's preparing and finding purpose while she waits. Choosing hope and having an expectant heart means to wait actively. And if we become complacent and passive to the things of God, we will miss out on the purpose for our waiting. There is purpose in your waiting. If we want what Jeremiah explains, we have to choose to trust. We have to choose hope. And the third thing is because what we do, God blesses. You see, Jeremiah's road was hard. It was full of challenges and stress. But he trusted and he hoped because there was a promised payoff. You see, your road might be filled with challenges and stress, but God promises some payoffs. He promises blessing. When we wait his way, when we choose to trust, when we choose hope, he blesses it. Let's look at Isaiah 30 verse 18. It says, the Lord wants to show his mercy to you. He wants to rise and comfort you. 
The Lord is a fair God, and everyone who waits for his help will be happy. So what's the blessing here? He will comfort you, he will be fair to you, and he will put a smile on your face. Let's look at Psalm 25.3. It says, no one who trusts you will be disgraced, but those who sin without excuse will be disgraced. So what's the blessing? Wait his way, and you can hold your head high with no shame, no disgrace. Let's look at Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. It says, surely you know, surely you have heard. The Lord is a God who lives forever, who created all the world. He does not become tired or need to rest. No one can understand how great his wisdom is. He gives strength to those who are tired and more power to those who are weak. Even children become tired and need rest, and young people trip and fall. But the people who trust the Lord will become strong again. They will rise up as an eagle in the sky. They will run and not need rest. They will walk and not become tired. So what's the blessing here? Strength, power, restoration. So in other words, he will equip you. He will give you what you need. Well, then let's look at Micah chapter 7, 7 through 8. It says, Israel says, I will look to the Lord for help. I will wait for God to save me. My God will hear me. Enemy, don't laugh at me. I have fallen, but I will get up again. I sit in the shadow of trouble now, but the Lord will be a light for me. What's the blessing? You are seen, noticed, and heard. And as we choose to trust, and as we choose hope, God will hear our prayers. And let me tell you, the enemy loves to keep people hopeless and isolated. Believing that God is against us, that God left us, that we're alone. That is right where the enemy wants us. But our God is a God of blessing. If you want to change the spiral you go down, if you, want, if you want what Jeremiah experienced, you have to go back to your promise. Go back to your promise. God promises to reward you and to bless you. God promises to give you what you need. And God promises to hear your prayers. As I close this morning, I want to share a, a season of waiting that I just recently went through. Um, I've grown up in the church my entire life. My dad has always been a pastor. You know, some might say the church is my second home, but honestly, my real home is my second home. <laughs> so obviously, I've seen God do a lot of cool things. And one of the things I've seen God do is baptize people in the Holy Spirit. And I always wanted to experience that for myself one day. And so a, a couple of years ago, a few years ago when I first came back to Neighborhood Church after college, I had a meeting with Pastor Lance, and we just talked about what's my next right step? What should I be seeking next? And for me, it was to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I prayed, and I worshiped, and I began to seek that gift wholeheartedly. So I started to wait on God. Months passed, a year passed, more months passed, and nothing. And I started to recognize some fears. I was afraid that I wasn't where I should be in my walk with God. I was afraid that there was something wrong with me. And I was especially afraid of this. I was afraid of what would happen when I let go of control and I let God do what he wants with my life with no reservation. So Encounter Conference came this last March, this year. And I had the thoughts of, you know, oh, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the moment. So I'm getting excited, right? Sunday morning service happens. It was awesome, but nothing for me. Sunday night service happened. It was awesome, nothing for me. And then Monday night service came, and Pastor Ronnie Vez spoke, and when it came to an altar call time, I was sitting right over there, and he said, all right, now if you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, come to the altar, come forward. And I'm like, I'm sitting over there, and I'm looking at Pastor Lance over here, and I'm like, do you want me to go play piano? Do you want me to go up there? He's like, no, no. So I'm like, okay, I just need to respond. Stop trying to distract yourself. So I face my fear, and I step out, and I come to the altar right here, and I just begin praying, and I begin crying. 
and people are praying over me. And still, nothing happened. <laughs> I began to cry tears of frustration. How long was I going to have to wait? Like, seriously, my heart was just, God, I just want what you have for me. Isn't that the right thing? So service ended, and I sat down in the front row, and I, people began mingling and talking, and I just was staring blankly into nothing. And someone came and sat down by me, and he looked at me, and he said, do you know what you carry? And I looked at him, caught off guard, and he asked me again, do you know what you carry? He says, I don't think you realize what you carry. You lead by following and ushering in the Holy Spirit. And he said, but I felt God tell me there is a fear in your heart. Fear to release what God wants for you. Do you trust him? And I immediately was like, of course. Of course I trust God. And he said, then do what he says. Obey him. So I go straight to my office, and I close the door. I turn off the lights, and I just begin to cry out before God. And I begin to pray out loud, and I began to talk to him. And as I did that, God gave me this visual of me just in this dark room. And there was a door um, in, that I was looking at in this dark room that was cracked slightly. And it, coming out from the door was just this bright, overwhelming light coming through. And it's just cracked. And so as I'm praying, I begin to pray out loud for God to just open that door all the way. And as I begin to pray for that, and I begin to connect my heart to my prayer, I began speaking in tongues. God gave me my prayer language. It wasn't my timing. It wasn't three years ago when I asked for it. It wasn't the perfect lighting or the perfect worship song playing like I thought. It wasn't even anyone praying over me. It was just me and God. In order to face the fear in my heart, I had to go back to my promise. God blesses those who wait on him. I chose to trust his timing and his control. I chose hope and expected him to fulfill his promise. And now I get to experience the blessing. And hear this, the blessing wasn't immediate. The waiting period was necessary. It was necessary because that's where I learned how to trust and to hope. And that's where I got to see God's purpose for my life. You see, when God makes a promise, we receive both a seed and a harvest. When we first get a promise, it's in seed form. Then we must wait until the seed becomes a harvest. You guys, our waiting is based on an expectation of the seed turning into a harvest. You see, Hannah waited for so long to have a child of her own. She endured so much disappointment, so much bullying, and a lot of heartache. She waited and she prayed. She waited, she waited actively by worshiping, by believing that God did hear her prayers. And finally, one day, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to her son Samuel. And then Hannah went on to have more children and a family of her own. She had to choose to keep going back to her promise because her promise led to her blessing. If you're tired of the waiting, I want to give you an opportunity this morning to make a choice to adjust the way that you've been waiting because how we wait counts. It, it really does because how we wait counts. It's either what will advance us into the purposes and the plans that God has for us or it will distract us and take us down a completely different path. Which is why the choice is so important. Would you stand with me this morning as the worship team comes? This morning, I want to give two different opportunities to respond. If you would, just close your eyes and bow your heads, just to give some privacy this morning. With no one looking around, the first opportunity I want to give is this. Maybe you've been doing things your way for some time now. And maybe you haven't started that relationship with the Lord yet. And today you want to make that commitment to God and give your life to him. If that's you, 
I want to give you an opportunity right now to accept the Lord with no one looking around. If you want to accept Jesus into your heart today for the first time, would you just raise your hand as a way of saying yes to God, yes to a relationship with him? Would you just raise your hand this morning? Thank you. second opportunity I want to give is this. Maybe I'm tired of the waiting. Maybe you've been taking things in your own hands for as long as you can remember. And you've let yet to let go of control and trust God's timing and his plan. And today you need to choose to trust Maybe the circumstances and struggles you're walking through feel seemingly hopeless. And just like Hannah chose hope while she waited on God, and just like she kept expecting God to fulfill his promise, today you need to choose hope. You want God to restore that expectant heart again. If that's you, if you want to make a change and choose to trust God and choose hope in God, would you raise your hand this morning? This is just between you and the Lord today. Would you raise your hand as a way of just saying, God, I'm choosing to trust. God, I'm choosing to hope. God, I'm choosing to go back to my promise. Let's pray. God, right now we come before you and we thank you for who you are. Thank you for always being there, God. Even when we don't feel it, even when we don't see it, we know from your word that you're always working things out for your good and for our good, Jesus. I want to pray for all of those in the room who accepted you for the first time. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them and equip them to follow you. Help them as they make you their new foundation. And God, today some of us are making a decision to trust you again. Some of us are choosing hope again. And I pray that these choices made today would change the way we wait. These aren't just Sunday morning choices, but God, these are daily choices we have to make every day. So God, I pray right now your blessing over each person in this room. As they choose trust, as they choose hope, would they also get to experience your amazing blessing? We know that your way is so much better. It's so much better because your intentions always have our best in mind. You love us and you are for us. You will always make a way. So help us remember these promises as we wait. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. going to close this morning and we're going to sing this song Waymaker one more time. Let's choose to worship him in the waiting. Let's choose to put our hope and our trust in him as we worship in the promises that he's made. He will always make a way. He will always be your light. He will always be working things out for your good. So can we just end on a strong note and worship him? Let's just go into that chorus strong. Waymaker, let's sing it together.